Welcome everyone to Chart Chat. We're excited to have you here today. Uh, happy July. It's hard to believe we're more than halfway through 2020 already. Uh, we're excited to have you join us today for a conversation about charts and about different topics related to data visualization more widely. I'm excited to be here with my co-hosts, uh, Steve, Andy, and Jeff. Chart Chat, it's more than just chit chat, it's Chart Chat. Um, our co-host today, again, Steve, Andy, Jeff, welcome to all of you. Happy to have you here today. Great to be here. Delighted to be here. Excellent. Um, our next Chart Chat Live won't be until September. We are going to be taking the month of August off, and we'll be returning in September with more special guests and more Chart Chat. On the agenda for our time today for the next hour is going to be talking about waffle charts and unit charts and related topics. Then chatting a bit about visualizing positions and networks, looking at some contact tracing diagrams that we've seen floating around. Looking at book feedback for Steve. Steve has a new book underway if you haven't seen some of his posts and asks around looking for great examples. And he's gonna give us a uh, quick view into some of the examples he's seen so far. A quick lightning round talking about iron viz where I'll defer to the experts on the line who have participated and in some cases won the iron viz competition and then any time for discussion and Q&A which we'll wrap up with today. Uh, we are excited to go ahead and shift over into waffle chats charts to start. We will have a final after party from 12 until 1230 Eastern time. So if you care to stay on the line and keep chatting about these different charts, topics and other things or asking more of your probing iron viz questions, feel free to go ahead and join the additional zoom link, which we'll post up at the very end of this session. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Steve, Jeff, who wants to kick it off today with the waffle charts? Um, I'll take that and then hand it to Jeff who will hand it back to me. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Um, so, you know, one of the things that I want to stress on all of this is um, you are encouraged to disagree. It's why I wanted to um, resurrect the discussions we had around the big book of dashboards. Uh, this is not an echo chamber. We get way better at this when someone gives pushback and says, well, I'm not really seeing it the same way that you are. And you all will, participants in this will have a kind of limited ability to disagree, but the after party, you can, you know, tell me or colleagues that were kind of full of whatever. Uh, we will all get better for that. So um, I want to start with this chart type just because I was bludgeoned with four or five different waffle charts, and I don't usually see them that much. And one of them came from Cole Nussbaum or Naflick who has submitted something that I hope to include in the upcoming book. Um, and you're looking at this and thinking, well, wait a minute, that looks kind of complex. Why would you, why would you use a waffle chart in this case? Wouldn't a bar chart or a pie chart be better? I will come back to this. There's a good reason for the choice of, of doing it this way. Um, so just showing this is a little unfair. So that was the first waffle chart that kind of came across. And then Randy Crum, a uh, colleague of ours wrote the excellent book, um, Cool Infographics. Uh, he also is submitting something. Um, specifically, I, I was looking for visualizations that really changed the way people thought about the data and said, oh my God, now that we see it this way, she we should really do this. And he was looking at a um, big budget gap in a major city and that they, they didn't have enough money to cover um, uh, many, many employees. And people just weren't getting it. And he was trying to say, all right, the gap that's here, it means we're going to have to eliminate this many police officers, firefighters, healthcare and human services. And he wanted some way to say, have, get a sense of just how many people that is. And he, and he did this grouped waffle chart this kind of unit chart. So that's the second one that I'm seeing within a week or 10 days. And then a friend of mine saw this great article in Scientific American trying to explain uh, issues with false positive and false, false negatives uh, around COVID testing. And they went with a waffle chart or this unit chart trying to show if you had 500 people. And so they have this 20 by 25 grid and explaining how these things might work and walking you through it with separate little dots that are in place. It's a very effective article. And then 
um, as the, the two biggest issues that we're facing at the moment uh, are, are as the pandemic and also uh, issues around racial inequality and systemic racism, particularly in the United States. And here was this really remarkable uh, visualization from Lindsay Poulter. If you don't follow her, you should. I mean, everything that she does is just, um, I find uh, so good on so many levels, design the analysis. But I think this kind of speaks for itself. A great use of a waffle chart to show the spartan sparseness in this case of the 500 um, companies in the Fortune 500, only five are led by black CEOs and none of them are women. And here's a, a way to uh, show this. So in the short period of time, I'm seeing this chart that I usually don't see that much. And um, Jeff, I'm gonna th uh, throw things over to you at this point, because I know you've, you've done some waffle charts and have pointed out some of the problems with them. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Absolutely. And get your thoughts on this. Yeah. Make sure I get and then, and, I, and by the way, I want to come back. I have a pop quiz for my uh, 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 colleagues here and see, I'm going to represent something with a waffle chart and see if they can guess what it is. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. So I, you know, here's some thoughts I have and, and, and some things I've encountered and, 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 and kind of walk through maybe some of these ideas here. Uh, the, this, the charts that you're looking at now, uh, hopefully there's there's a pie chart on the left hand side. Now this data is fake. It, it comes from real data, but but I, I, I sort of mocked it up. Um, and and the chart on the left was a real chart with some real data in it at, at one point, done by a major you know uh, global investment banking firm. Uh, and it was in a deck. And uh, you know the people in my company know my my sort of my disdain for pie charts. And and the question came up is you know Jeff, do, you, do should we address this pie chart? Should we change it to something? else and and you know I, I sort of let it go and and I think that that brought up some questions as to you know why right um, and and the thing is for me I, I you know doing this a while with deal especially dealing with pie charts um, I kind of saw the problem you know right away is that you just have this one number that is taking over the chart right there's 90 percent of transactions and again this is fake data um, but imagine you know point of sale transactions you know 90 plus percent of them have to be credit card or cashless payments at this point uh, and so you have this one big thing that's taking over all of the rest and you know our natural thought is well uh, make it a bar chart, right? We'll fix a pie chart. We'll turn it into a bar chart. And if you do that with data like this, you 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 have a problem. You know, here's here's your transactions where your other transactions are are sort of squished to the the axis, the y axis in this case, and you you can't see the data. It becomes you know really sort of you can't see the colors, um, and so it becomes a surface area problem. Uh, and so. Uh, then you're just really relying on labels to get the data. And, and at that point, you probably should just have a table. Uh, it, it, your, your bar chart really isn't giving you any meaningful comparison. So in playing with that, I thought, well, you know, there's probably other ways we could do that without, uh, without it being a pie chart. And one of them is maybe a waffle chart or some variations on that that I was kind of playing with. The first one on the left you know, sort of a waffle, but I, I kind of pulled the transactions out so that you could see the individual dots. Uh, and in that case, probably really easy to count three dots or four dots. I don't think anybody's going to sit there and count, you know, a nine by 10 grid and, and, and uh, or 37 dots. You're probably not going to count something like that, but easy to see that one has more than the other if you want to visually represent that. I think a waffle chart does pretty good in this case uh, because you can see nine rows out of the 10 rows and you can count the three dots and the four dots. And I don't think we lose any of that information. And then there's another variation that I use. I, I sort of named it the Lego chart, uh, but I, I add shading to the waffle chart. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but um, by, by putting sort of a band around it, it's kind of like right a stacked bar uh, almost um, on, on the last row, uh, but I shade the area around the dots. Um, so let me, let me talk about why I did that and, and specifically why I use round, round dots. Um, there's a visual uh, illusion problem that occurs that we often see in waffle charts that people um, maybe overlook, but, but it is talked about, and, and it's the visual artifact that's created. Um, there, there's a German uh, 
uh, philosopher, I think, uh, who, or uh, um, and speech, I think it was involved in speech uh, as well, but um, Hermann, uh, the Hermann effect, um, don't, don't count my German pronunciation there, but Her Hermann uh, is uh, uh, the, the scintillating grid, and that, that scintillating grid is, is, if you're staring at this, you probably already see it as you're looking around, but there's these gray dots that move around. It's like this motion that's not really there is being created from the corners of those gray squares in the white area. And we often see that, especially it pops out to me all the time when people use a giant page of waffle charts. Um, you know, this is a, a this is just a, a normal waffle chart, but but it has this these gray dots that sort of start moving around on you. And um, you could imagine if you had a whole page of those that, that that could be quite distracting. Now there's a couple of things you could do to that. One of them being is if you make them round, that effect sort of goes away. Uh, and especially size. And if you create distance between them, a little bit of space that that, that artifact will uh, sort of diminish and, and go away. So that's, that's sort of the technique I do is if I'm going to do this, I'm probably going to use round dots. And then I add shading in there to help as well. And you know, looking through my, my Tableau public page, I don't, I don't have a few hundred visualizations on there. This is one of the only ones. I had two waffle charts on there. This one and a Makeover Monday where I use this as a template for the Makeover Monday. And, uh, I, and, and you know, I, look, I don't use waffle charts a lot, but let me walk you through why I decided to use a waffle chart in this particular viz and, and see if I can make a case for it, at least for certain um, data. Uh, and the story here, I did a blog post on this. It was uh, a blog post about my trumpet teacher at the Conservatory of Music here in Cincinnati. Uh, she was the first woman trumpet player in a major symphony orchestra in the United States. And that's pretty remarkable. Even today, as you'll see from the waffle chart, only 3% of trumpet players in the major symphony orchestras are women. And here she was, uh, you know, in the, in the coming out of music school in a different age. And she, she was the first woman to play in a major symphony orchestra. And I interviewed her. There's a blog post on my blog page about her and, and that story. Cause I actually think, you know, it's, it probably has parallels to today in the data analytics world. But back to the waffle chart, I think what the story here is what I was trying to show is those three red dots around her in the trumpet section. And, and there's really no easy way to show that. You know, I published this viz and the first comment, I think Cock, uh, Cock Reeves, uh law on this, somebody immediately said, this would be better as a bar chart. It happened right away. First tweet when I posted this visualization. And, uh, and I said, you know, I, I agree. Maybe as a whole, this, this probably would be. But what I lose is the story that I was really trying to focus on is these certain sections of the orchestra, the trumpet, the trombone, the tuba, where there's only three of them. And if I put that as a bar chart, you're not going to see the 3% that's the bar, which is what my story is really about that I want you to focus on. And so then what do I do? Then I could reverse the data and I could say, okay, well then I'll show the 97%. Well, in a story about women in the orchestra, I'm going to focus on the men. That seems like a bad idea. So that's really what led me to choose a waffle chart in this example was to really quickly, you can scan down this table and say, wow, a lot of women play harp uh, in, in, the, in the symphony orchestra. It's sort of dominated, but look at that brass section and look at the percussion and look at even the concert master. And the concert master is really interesting when you think that, you know, you do have a lot of violin players, more than half of the violin players in an orchestra are women, but yet the leading violin is the concert master or the concert mistress there, there's not many of those. That's, that's an interesting thing in the data. And I just felt like when I put this as a bar chart, I lost that story. The story wasn't apparent to me in an easy to read way. Maybe there's another way to do this. Um, I certainly wasn't going to put a page of pie charts because uh, then, then Steve and Andy wouldn't let me write another book with them. Um, so that's, uh, that's my story with waffle charts and, and a real world case that I thought it worked. And um, I'll, I'll turn it back over for some dialogue on it. Yeah, do leave it up up for a minute. Yeah. Uh, there's some great comments and questions coming in. Thanks to everybody and all of you making comments. If you want to stick around for the after party, uh, please do, because we'd love to hear you voice those comments. Who well, wants to go uh, first? I've, I, go ahead. I've got some uh, comments, but I've already, uh, had, uh, I've already <laughs> had the table for a little bit. 
I, uh, having, having always lambasting, anybody should never just say should have been a line shot. I, I was looking at this one in prep for this this morning. And I, I don't know what, what it is, but I think it's the small multiple waffle charts I have the biggest problem with because here I'm looking at 1,900 marks because there's 19 of these squares to, to consume 19 pieces of information. And there's something there that sometimes I'm like, this could have been made more simple. And if you were telling the story of highlighting trumpet, trombone, and tuba, you know, you could have used a different encoding to focus on those three bits. Um, that, yeah, that's always, that, that, that's always my issue with waffle charts. It's like, it, it, you get that sense of real, the units, these represent people, but is it overwhelming for the user to consume? That's funny, Andy, because I actually think, and I've seen in when I've done workshops and worked with folks, that the small multiple waffle chart layout is like the easy step away from people who love their side-by-side -side pie charts for reasons I can't understand, because it gives you an opportunity to showcase and focus on each individual metric for each individual mm -hmm. share. So each each one of these um, different instruments, for example, versus yeah. having it all combined into one. And I think it's really nice for actually looking at the distinctions and the kind of relative coverage that you see in these. And I love Jeff's addition of the kind of reference line down the middle. That helps a lot in terms of interpreting if you're kind of at that equal share or not. Um, I, I actually find that in the small multiple layout is when I like them the most uh, compared to thinking about how to use them in individual charts or graphs. Like the example that Steve showed at the very beginning is actually a pretty complex waffle chart with lots of different segments. I think they're the most effective, especially in a small multiple view, when it's only two segments. You only have two different categories and you're not trying to color a ton of those different dots. That's a great point. Yeah, that's going to be really hard when you start stacking them to find out where one stops and one starts. That, that's an interesting design uh, flaw there, I guess. Yeah. Well, and Steve, I don't know if you can pull up that one you put up at the very beginning. Yeah, I'm, but I thought it was I'm gonna I'm gonna show the walkthrough, the reveal of it in a minute. Yeah, but I, just wanna, I think there's another, that's the one that's an, interesting there. Let me let me say, since Andy doesn't like pages of it, let me show this one before Steve jumps in. Is uh, you know an XKCD graph on mm -hmm. you know just you know putting your idea around money. I, I just I love this. I, I've oh. always loved this and the amount of work that goes into this. But he starts and this is in super, super high DPI, by the way, you can drill yep. down into this all the way, you know, into the each individual square. But he starts with a dollar and then he shows the size of the dollar going into the next one and that's 1000s. And then he takes it into millions. And then the millions go into billions and, and all of these these boxes of all these different things to compare sort of our concept of what's the difference between a dollar and a trillion dollars that's that's almost an impossible thing for us to understand so um i really appreciated that uh, one. this is a great piece of work hey jeff can you go back one second to the um uh, the, the orchestra um because there's another concrete quote that's in my head something along oh, the dear. lines of uh, <laughs> every chart is a compromise and um there are way more um, string players, violin and viola players in an orchestra than there are harpists. When was the last time you saw 25 harpists on, on, <laughs> uh, on a stage? You know, a lot, of, a, a lot of American orchestras probably don't even employ a full-time harpist because a lot of repertoire doesn't have that. So, you know, this, the, if we were to get into oh, we should make the size of the waffles different based on, you know, the proportion of how many there are in an orca, and it becomes a much more complicated type of issue. So this is essentially the equivalent of 100% stacked bar charts, but where you're not considering the size of the population, mm -hmm. and then you say, oh, well, I guess we'd have to do this as a Merrimako type of thing, and a really narrow sliver for the harp players versus this wide swath for the violins and stuff like that. Um, I really like this viz recognizing some of the uh, some of the compromises that Jeff had to make. You know, the really nicely fifty percent demarcation point, mm -hmm. and and to get the discussion happening, and also just the the um, incredible you know great use of color, the baton, and the you know the filling up at the top to show the you know the percentage up there, um, and I just think you know stellar work on that. Well, Amanda, I'm ready to go back and, 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 you know, that waffle chart that I showed, which doesn't have the Herman effect problem. So let me, uh, um, uh, let me go ahead and show this here. So uh, in this case, um, the, the, you'll notice that because 
there isn't a lot of space between the squares. It's just kind of putting borders around things. You're not getting that, that the, the little scintillating dots that are there. Um, look, the first thing when I saw this and said, yeah, I appreciate you wanting to use units. Why not do something, you know, like this, you know, um, have these little pictogram or isotypes that's general gender neutral icon uh, that's there. And I can do the accuracy, can, accurate comparisons but this was a case where the person producing the work really knew the audience well. And there was a slow reveal or seduction. They said, consider a square. Well, here are the 99 people that we surveyed. And of those 99, 10 didn't have a preference. 70 preferred the product that we make. And so, all right, they, they, it, 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 it unraveled, it unfolded, and people were able to understand how the components of the chart work together. And this very effective use of, of, okay, I'm understanding each of those squares refers to a person. And Randy Crum reminded me of this incredible, powerful video. Jeff mentioned it yesterday as well, uh, the fallen of World War II, trying to use these icons um, uh, to you know, try to get a sense of how many people, how many people that is. When you hear about this many people dying, what does that look like? How how does your mind process it? And I decided, you know, what I was going to take a pretty famous data set and apply this technique, the same that Jeff did, Neil Halloran did, and I want to see if my colleagues can guess what this is. So I'm letting you know that each of these icons represents 100 people. What am I trying to show here? This is this is a data set all three of you know. And if I and I'm I'm hoping you don't get it, but then I will give you a hint and I hope you do get it. So that's four thousand one hundred and twenty against one hundred. Is that right? Yeah, but each 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 of the things represents oh, so 100. 100. 100 people. So that square, that big square up there, you know, if you take the, the you know, that, that that's 10,000. So it's 412,000 against 1,000. Against 10,000. Mark, Mark, Mark Bradburn gave it away. I think I'm going to go with Napoleon's March, uh, the 440,000 oh. coming back at 10. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. Four, yeah, 422,000 oh. went out. 412 died. 10,000 survive so well done mark yeah well done well done to mark for sure i definitely would yeah. not have gone right straight to that without mark giving it away in the chat yeah I'm, that, that was going to be my hint it was over <laughs> here and going wait a minute that's four hundred twenty-two thousand. what does this mean it's and it's the died uh and survived okay with that um um so by the way i'm wondering if Men menard were alive today what you know i'm sure he'd be doing something in you know, animation he'd be in the, oh, he'd totally be animating I, yeah. I have one more question about waffle charts would uh do you ever see them used in a business dashboard uh and <laughs> would you ever use one mm. somebody asked that question in the chat and and said you know the the one of the other issues i guess is it takes up a lot of real estate if you're going to do mm -hmm. small multiples so that that's that's a good point i, I you know that's not conducive sometimes to no. A printout or a business dashboard I, i'll just answer that question for what i have is i don't think there's one on my tableau server i i i don't think we have one no yeah, i've only I, ever seen them used in reporting so if you're like sharing yeah. final evaluation results or in a report or an infographic is mm -hmm. where i've seen them used more frequently and part of it i think is the novelty factor that it's something that looks a little bit different and it's that very nice square shape that kind of tiles and grids really nicely yeah. together in an infographic layout by the way, that was a consideration in the, in the write-up of why Cole went with that particular chart. It was the audience, and it was a novel chart type, and there was somebody guiding other people through it. And it mm -hmm. made it proved to be the most effective way to do it. And then there's also the question, well, is what that person was showing, was that a dashboard or not? And we can uh, have another three-hour discussion about that <laughs> at some other time. Yeah. So, Amanda. All right, so let's talk a little bit about visualizing positions and networks, because this has been something that I've been looking at a lot lately and seen popping up on my feed, uh, especially in the last week related to a certain case cluster in North Carolina. 
So when we think about visualizing, visualizing positions and networks, I need something that's not COVID since I think that's been what saturated my mindset for the past six mm -hmm. months. So uh, we usually think of network diagrams and network diagrams that show us the relationships between uh, different individuals or different items within a group. Uh, and that let us actually oftentimes see the size of different nodes based on the size of the circle or the bubble. This is a fun one to explore if you like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, there's also ways we look at position in space, and uh, Ken Fleurlage has done a bunch of great work kind of thinking about how to use trigonometry within Tableau in order to make these kind of different maps and actually lay out information in space. And so he had done a post about building a social distancing floor plan or testing and seeing really if your office's current floor plan accommodates social distancing. Um, you can read the full write-up and you'll see that there's a lot of other notes and considerations about it being more than just where your chair is located to safely return to work if you want to read those additional considerations. But I think it's a good example of the ways we take the tools that we have and the tools that we know, whether it's Tableau or some other platform, and find ways to adapt them to display different kinds of information visually. Which brings me to contact tracing diagrams, which I find fascinating, interesting, and oftentimes very inaccessible when you kind of look at what they look like within larger CDC case studies. So calling out a couple different contact tracing diagrams shared in CDC papers. All of these I never saw really flood the, the, uh, the Twitter sphere or other spaces. And you can probably guess why. So here's an early one looking at two family gatherings in Chicago. You can see that each of the different uh, squares is representing someone who actually was infected as part of that family gathering. And you'll see on this case, the x-axis actually is a count of days of how long did it take to identify the case. It's on the day of the investigation was the case, when the case was found. And this gives us a sense of how long it took to find people who were related back to an index case at this event. Then we've got this very complicated diagram. This is a group exercise class in South Korea where each of those individual shapes, and now we have lots of shapes flooding our screen, try to give us a sense of who was infected based on a given exercise class. And you see day of symptom onset across the bottom. So the dates or the time is actually related to when symptoms presented not based on when the case was found. So it's important if you choose to dig into these more technical diagrams to always go ahead and read what the notation layer looks like and what all the labels are because they're not always consistently presented. Last of the three examples I'll show from these technical reports is this example from a restaurant. And this to me starts to make information a bit more accessible and usable to understand what happened within a context. Because similar to the example from the social distancing floor plan, it's looking more at people's positions in space inside of a restaurant here. And you can see that there's two parts to this. I've kind of broken it apart and put them side by side for layout. But you'll see that there's an overall floor plan off to one side that shows the overall restaurant layout and then shows you the segment here that we're zooming in on and where the air conditioning flowed. This was from a initial contact tracing study that looked at the ways in which airflow and air conditioners could actually help to move viral particles or infection. So you see those people seated at tables C, A, and B over here on our left are the ones who show up as our red circles, which is our infected persons, and that yellow circle is the index patient. So I think this has kind of taken this information and simplified it a bit more to make it more accessible to folks if they want to see and understand kind of how easily it is for COVID-19 to spread in a certain environment. But the actual contact tracing infographic I saw that was the most popular and actually popped up was not one of these technical diagrams. Um, I got sent by multiple people this infographic on the community case spread from uh, Catawba County in North Carolina. It was published as part of a short format write-up emphasizing the importance of minimizing large gatherings and being careful because of how COVID-19 can spread. And as we look at this diagram, I'm curious, co-hosts, what do you think about this diagram of, uh, of this case study of community spread from a picnic? My instant visceral response is, ugh. <laughs> uh, and, and given the intense, the, the exercise of actually looking at it because we're talking about it, um, I confess that when I did dive into it deeper, I was like, yeah, it shows me something, but I couldn't really get over my visceral response to the way it looked. I had the same reaction. It, it crossed my uh, Twitter feed too, and uh, people were, were sending it around. I, I guess, you know, this kind of 
you know, we, we talk many, many episodes about the, the, the Florence Nightingale, you know, diagram and, you know, could that be done in a different way? You, you go back in historical times, it had an effect. And I, I will say I'll defend it, you know, just from the standpoint of people seem to engage in it for whatever reason. And so if that works, then I guess that works. It's, it's certainly not how I probably would have designed it, but it's fascinating. Andy? Sorry, yeah, I will add though that the the light blue bit in the bottom right is actually quite interesting to follow. It's like following a maze, right? And there's something mm -hmm. actually about the trail. I'm like, there was the family. Oh, then they went to a beach, and then there's something about that is quite compelling once you actually commit to looking at it. That one extra annotation layer, huh? Steve, yeah. any thoughts before we start unpacking this a bit? The the I don't buy people understanding this or doing that amount of work playing this out as separate things and showing this is what happened here and then this happened and then this happened and it spread to this and some form of animation maybe but you know I've, I've used the expression we are all professional chart looker adders mm -hmm. and if we're having problems understanding these things is this is supposed to appeal to lay people who don't live and breathe charts I think this is a, a big failure. By the way, of everything you've shown, the only one I can come close to understanding is that one. Yeah, <laughs> everything else is I have no the the, the one with the with the um uh the the the, cl the Korean class that looks that looks to me like a um uh, the diagrams that are used to um, diagram choreography. You know, to explain right, it. here's the dance move that you're supposed to be using as opposed to the spread of a disease in a class. So, but then this is super useful for someone who actually is an epidemiologist, for example, right? So it all comes yes. down for me, and I wanted to fl flag these examples today because I think we've had a lot of conversations about kind of what works and what doesn't, but these give some really tangible pieces of what works and what doesn't for different audiences. Yeah. And so it's the, the folks at CDC love these diagrams, and they can be super amen. helpful. Amen. <laughs> so Amen. if we go it's ahead and we, in and we look at this, um, so we look at this whole kind of contact tracing piece, then my immediate kind of mind jumps to what do I want to know from this, right? And the thing that seemed to jump out to people when I talked to them was, oh my gosh, it shows just how many other people can be impacted from a small gathering. Now there's a lot of information missing here. I don't know how big the picnic was. 14 people, was that most of the attendees? Was it a smaller share? Because we're only looking at actual cases here. And it's not easy for me to quickly be able to kind of see how big these different clusters were until you actually follow these lines out. So my first gut response was that even a kind of light mock-up of a, a network diagram that said we have different families of different sizes that then each impacted different groups of people or clusters helps us better see or understand kind of what happened. And things jump out, like four people impacted by that trip to the beach by that one initial family versus others. And you can see those different clusters and how they kind of break out in a more- Amanda, look, wait, but just look at how you're, you're, you're unfolding this. You didn't <laughs> just show that chart. You did this and then this and then this. And it's oh, like, absolutely. Oh, I'm it came to life. Have we improved already? Uh, you have. Definitely, yeah. And, and the other thing <laughs> yeah. is, you know, you're using, you're using size now to represent yep. the number in the family and it's, uh, it's got more space and it's, you know, the rounded bubbles. I mean, it's, uh, I love it already. Yep. And, I've, and I've respected their choice almost of their initial color palette. It may not have been what I chose, but for the sake of being able to follow this story, let's hold on with these rainbow colors, right? So if it's we go lovely. ahead and we go from this, we've now encoded information. Instead of just being with lots of same size hexagons, I can see that information with these different size bubbles and I can see the relationships. Now we've removed some additional explaining information, which is where I think things like tooltips or animations are helpful. If I could hover over and see that this was the 85 year old grandparent, right? and be able to see more information that way. So this is where I think animations and starting with that big picture and then drilling in and seeing those details is really helpful. But there are limitations, of course, when you're publishing static graphics. Now, I went ahead and I pulled the data off of this. I mean, this functionally is a data set itself, right? And if you pull down kind of a sample data set from this piece and start playing with it, and you'll see my quick playtime in Tableau with this. Um, besides looking at a network diagram, what I really want to know is kind of how many people were impacted, right? I want to see some initial summary statistics on what happened. So 14 confirmed cases among the attendees would be helpful to have the total size of the picnic. And then 27 confirmed attendees among attendee contacts. So we can see that almost double the number of people were infected as secondary or tertiary infections. 
I can break that out further by starting to look at this more as data and not just by position in space and understand kind of which family clusters were perhaps biggest. And I can start to look at who was infected by actually using these notations of the role as a category and see just how many coworkers were infected by people who attended this picnic. And notably, patient is also someone who was probably impacted in a workplace. And so to me, this starts to give you additional profiles and pieces of information on who was impacted in the course of kind of the secondary infections from this actual picnic. You can even break those down by adult or child. Only one additional child was impacted versus the rest of the share of the 27 being adults. So as we look at this and we think about kind of how we present information, I think sometimes these contact tracing studies, um, it helps when they're being disseminated more widely to see them more in a way that makes sense to us. So I'd be curious from your side, is this kind of information helpful for making more sense of how quickly COVID-19 can spread in a given environment or just showing the spread of any kind of disease or idea? I... I, 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 there's something, right, let's see if I can get the words out to describe this correctly, right? Uh, in, the, in the original and your circly makeover, I'm like, we've got four, A, A B, and C, and D. I'm like, and I don't really, at that point, I, I don't really know what the different colors represented, but I'm very comfortable. I have no anxiety looking at the position there. And then when you show the bar charts and the, the unit charts, um, suddenly um, my anxiety level has gone through the, I'm like, what the hell is A, B, and C, and D? I don't know. I don't know because I've got no, you know, it's just an abstract concept. So I'm trying to read the bar chart and just thinking, I can't understand it because I'm thinking, what, where's the legend? Mm -hmm. Where's the legend? So there's something about the original one, which obviously has a categorization, but its layout means I don't need to worry about it. Whereas I'm very worried about it trying to pass the ones on the right side. And there's certainly some need for additional legends and cleanup. So forgive my sloppiness. I'm not. Uh, well, no, it, it, it's it's not to do with. I don't think it's to do with the sloppiness. It's 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 just the the, the chart format itself. Mm. I, it, somehow for me, I'm, those columns mean I I need to be able to pass a to, a to d, whereas this arbitrary position in a circle didn't have me thinking that in the first place. It's not your sloppiness. I, I, I love what you did, Amanda. And I think uh, you're a crowd favorite on here on the uh, chat window. Somebody, you know, you, they said you're crushing it. Chart chat makeover live here. People, yeah. people seem to like what you did. Um, I, you know, there's certainly, I, I know you're just mocking this up as, and not like actually doing a real redesign here, but I, I really love it. I think the details you dove into are exactly the questions people would ask. And um, I really, I really like what you did. Thanks. Well, and the question I always think of is like, are, these are the kind of things I think that if this is the information that is really in interesting and meaningful and impactful for people to understand and see, I think one thing we can think about as data viz professionals is how do we make that information more accessible by anticipating and understanding the questions. And I'd love to see this as a makeover Monday exercise, something like, you know, which is, hey, here's really important data that, that people need to understand, you know, how this thing, uh, infects others, and how do we get people to be able to see it and 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 understand um, the severe consequences of very casual behavior? Um, so uh, you know, we should contact Eva and Charlie, Eva Murray and Charlie Hutchinson, and say, might they consider um, that example um, and let the uh, you know you know the the incredible minds that participate in Makeover Monday, and we may come up with, wow, what a great way to get this across. Mm -hmm. Well, and if there was even templates that made it easier for someone to spin up a quick profile of a case study or a cluster study, I think that would be a really interesting thing to dive into. I want to recognize before I hand it over to you, Steve, to talk about the book, uh, that there is some loss of information here, right? Because we're not giving that story piece that Andy called out as being so interesting and seeing the annotations and other pieces. So I think some consideration could be made on how to add that layer of storytelling in and understanding. But um, overall, really appreciate the feedback and the thinking from folks about kind of how we leverage our skills in ways to make these kind of diagrams more accessible. Steve, yeah, nice you want to take it over to talk about the book? Yeah, just, just a couple of submissions for the book. So um, I've got a new book in the works. It's really for um, lay business people on, on how data visual, it's called The Big Picture, uh, How to Use Data Visualizations to Make Better Decisions Faster. Last chapter of the book is tentatively titled, You May Not Change the World, But You Can Change Your Organization. 
and I'm looking for examples where, hey, no one got it, no one understood it when we were doing it this way, but when we presented the data this way, things clicked and it changed the way the organization thought about data. And I've gotten a bunch of submissions, including one that comes from Klaus Schulte, a fellow Tableau Zen master, won the um, Iron Biz competition, uh, European Iron Biz competition, does absolutely brilliant work. Um, he's also a professor of uh, accounting in Munster, Germany. Um, and he has been trying to get um, uh, the financial world uh, to you know, embrace data visualization. It's one of the last bastions of, no, you can just have my spreadsheet. And this may fall more into the category of, uh, no, this hasn't made an impact yet, but imagine if people were looking at it this way. And we'll talk about when I say, who are the people we're talking about looking at it? So let me share what, he, what he's put together. And, and uh, I'm gonna ask your take on it. So here is a reimagined um, profit and loss statement for Daimler Benz. And he's got some filters, he's showing 2018. And um, there's a, there is a, by law, a way that you have to present this data, a standard P&L statement, and it is boring tabular data. And here he's saying, look how much easier it would be for us to see what's going on in the organization if we were to show it like this. And I've got my thoughts, but I'd like to hear yours first. I'll jump in. Happy to, happy to do that. Um, you know, I, I, the audience has probably heard us say this on chart chats before. Certainly we say it all the time in, in our workshops, but to me, you know, it's who's your audience, what's your message. I think if the audience here are accountants, um, then I, I don't know. I, I think they probably would just like to see the table that's, you know, the AICPA standards or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's requirements of how that's done and, and every, balance, every financial statement looks the same, right? People know how to read it, so there's a standardization. Um, now flip over if I'm in the business side, uh, I'd much prefer this, you know, as an executive, you know, looking at it outside of the accounting department. I think this gives me more information probably quicker and, um, and I hate reading those tables. So I, I think there's, there's probably something said on either side and, and the particular view here, I really, I really like it. I mean, I, I really, it tells me the scale of things and, and how that comes in. Um, I think I mentioned yesterday when we were, we were talking, you know, another one that I've done and had success with is a waterfall chart. And, uh, you know, instead of, you know, sort of a sand key view, you know, maybe a waterfall chart would, would also be effective in something like that. And then, you know, as you switched over, Steve, you have your table and you have your waterfall. So, you know, you sort of have both in this case. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, do like, I, I do like this. Steve, what, what does the curve going upwards mean? Um, you know, um, well, the, the, these things going upwards yeah. versus downwards, I'm not exactly sure. Um, it may just be... Um, I think they're just breaking off. I, I, yeah. I think... Uh, but, but why are some... But some go down and some go mm -hmm. up. There, there's... And, 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 okay, so let, let's take that as a rhetorical question. I mean, I think I agree with everything Jeff says. This is, this is an awesome thing. But, and then, but then little flourishes like this it's like, are you, are you going to be able to educate the user so they understand what these are? Uh, or do you need to make this intuitive enough so that every curve and mark mm. movement it, actually it, it, makes sense? Is, there's a bunch of stuff in this I don't understand immediately, uh -huh. but I'm not necessarily the target audience. No. But, but I, well, it's, so I don't know what the ones no. going up and the ones going down mean. Klaus, uh, Klaus, Klaus is on and a few other participants. It's additional income, I guess, coming in. Um, mm -hmm. So they, they've answered that, I think, in the chat uh, window there. To me, one of the most useful, I, I think it's aesthetically very intriguing and draws me in, which I think is great. Um, I think one of the most helpful parts for me to kind of parse this is actually those magenta, lighter magenta bands that tell me where it mm. stops since I kind of lose that gray line sometimes when I'm, if I'm a little bit far away from the computer. Uh, so I think those bands actually help a lot to giving kind of a focus moment of what the stop points are without making it super dominant on the biz. Um, and create and a so bar chart for comparison. Yes. Well, that, so it's and not that's an aligned scale right though here. is the issue. Is that, you know, I can, I can make a pretty rough estimate that, you know, 
one sixth of this, um, you know, five sixths of this is cost of sales. Just this part that's right here, and that's what's flowing out here. And and th and that's my, you know, I want to ask, you know, I'm looking forward to discussing this with with Klaus and the reaction that people have had to it. Um, is that that are people being just mesmerized by the sand key? And you know, it's 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 this pretty big dominating. Uh, piece of this thing and it's and it's beautiful and he's got the gradient going here and are they able to and and are they able to do what what he hopes they're able to do which is hey i've got a really good understanding of where stuff is going because of the flow um and in, in fact i can kind of you know see this is about one six of this and then okay this looks to be about you know whatever this is selling looks to be you know maybe about one third of of the gross profit, and 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 is it working? Um, you know, I'm channeling my inner Stephen Few type of yes, but you want to be able to make accurate comparisons, and can you do that with this, or is that not even that? Is that not essential? So that 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 that's what I'm trying to get um, my my hands around. I also like the the interaction where you you know you click the show values it, it goes over to a percentage um, so that you know gives you additional information and then you know of course you can interact with the years I I, I think it's well done for the mm -hmm. right audience. Mm -hmm. Yep, and just filling in with the you know the notion of so but you know go to his public profile and his blog you can see earlier attempts at this but you know falling into the category of oh, maybe this hasn't had this huge impact yet, but imagine if we started doing these things and, and um, in the same way that, that um, when I saw one of Jeff's early visualizations quantify itself, it made me think, I want to work with this guy. I want to know this person. This is the same reaction that I had when Amanda presented a tapestry a couple of years ago um, uh, saying, hey, I think this would be a better way to impart um, um, uh, uh, health statistics and lab results. Um, here's the general population and, and you who carry this particular um, um, uh, genetic mutation. It's genetic mutation here, here would be your risk associated with it and just went, oh my gosh, this is so much clearer. Uh, yes, what a great way to, to, uh, to show this. And um, more recently saw work from um, uh, um, uh, Pictal Health, uh, Katie McCurdy, I think, mm -hmm. um, and uh, an attempt to show, hey, rather than me explaining my health history, here's a way to visualize it so that doctors and um, uh, care personnel can have a better sense of what, what I have gone through. I find I'm just think, oh, this would be such a better way to try to relate the information. So this all fits under the category of imagining how great the world would be if we could visualize things this way. <laughs> I, I just have to say, I love this viz. This Me viz too. is so powerful and, and so much data encoded on here in such a beautiful way. I, I've always loved this one. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. It is beautiful work. If anyone's looking for more on kind of how she constructs these, she's got a great Medium blog that talks about the various ways she kind of collects this data and collects this information, work she's done with veterans. I mean, it's such a comprehensive snapshot of health, and especially in a world where, I mean, I, 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 speaking to the health piece that Steve just shared, I mean, I've seen many different doctors in different systems, and when you see different doctors in different systems, you have to recap the same information over and over and over again, and this is just such an easy way to give that snapshot. Klaus, you you have a new slogan, Klaus. You're you're Menard with money. That's what they call you now. So. <laughs> uh, That's so, not uh, bad. Being mindful where we are on time, I know we promised everyone that they'd hear a couple of tips, tricks, and ideas on Iron Fizz. Um, I'm going to defer to the Iron Fizz contestants and uh, my master of ceremonies on this one. Uh, what do you, are is top of mind for you with Iron Fizz this year, especially with the new format? Jeff, you want to go? Boy, it's going to be tough. I think I, I, my initial reaction was, "Wow, ouch!" Uh, all in one competition, you know, is the new format rather than the three different subjects, uh, and then taking the sort of the, I guess, the top three is how, how they're doing it. Um, you know, it's really just really interesting. Um, 
I, it, I, let me just give you general thoughts. I, I love the Iron Viz. One of my favorite times of year, um, you know, as participating in it. I don't know that I'd ever participated in it again because I, I, when you when you think about oh the amount of work and then you get on that stage and it's just uh, it's it's a little bit um, it's crazy. Let's just say that. It, and it, it took for me the hardest part was uh, was managing around the conference at at the time. So it, you know, I felt like mm-hmm. I there's things I wanted to do at the conference, but I was always worried about you know, practicing and, and whatnot. So, um, but I, I love seeing the work. I think it's a great thing in the community. I think people put out the best efforts. We always see amazing work, even for people who don't win, you know, there's just uh, visits that just astound everybody in the community. And, and I, I just love seeing that work. So one, one that has crossed our path, he just published it a day or two ago, Zach Bowders on um, CMYK and, um, uh, comic books with black characters in it. And is he gonna win? I don't know, but it's an incredible piece of work, you know, combination of design and analytic integrity. So it's an incredible thing to have in one's portfolio. Um, for me, the, cha- the, the thing I'm happiest to see in this, and I was gonna petition for Tableau to do this and they did it without me opening my big fat mouth, is they raised the prize money on this thing, you know, $10,000 for first place, 5000 to that everybody gets some, because now the amount of work that you have to put into this thing, <laughs> you get the data weeks ahead of time and you are miserable for weeks. You know, you know, back in the olden days when I was doing it, I was miserable for days. You know, I got the data. We all got the data Monday afternoon. And it was on punch card, Steve. You got it on punch card, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and they dropped. I dropped them all and I had to resort them. Um, <laughs> so it, it kind of kills your conference because you're practicing and doing this and getting your. But now you're putting these people through a very tough experience for weeks. And I'm glad to see that that, that the prize money has been upped. Uh, quite a bit. So bravo to Tableau and Salesforce for doing that. Yeah, we've certainly upped the level of support we're giving contestants should they reach the uh, final stages. We are still in the process of working out exactly how we do Iron Viz, given that there is no physical conference this year. It will exist. We don't know the format of that yet. Uh, so that might change the pressure on the contestants. We don't know. Uh, I'd just say... hired a staff psychiatrist now, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'd also add, not everybody had the same experience as Steve. Some people uh, do really enjoy the experience, oh, no, but it no, no, is no, no, extremely okay. time-consuming. It really does. I, I, a shout out to Curtis Harris. He's the only one I know who just, you know, he'll, I think he tries every time, and he, he's destined to be on that stage again. He loves it. Yeah, well, I don't absolutely. know anyone that well, – you, thank you, Andy, and I take – you're right. I don't know – take anyone that isn't glad that they didn't participate, but it is something which is – it, uh, it makes it hard to just take in the rest of the conference because this thing is always in your head and you're thinking, is there better? You, you know the deal. Well, yeah, and, and, you know, another, change, another change they made is they moved the Iron Viz sooner in the conference, which yep. I think really helps too. I, you know, it was like the last day of the last session when I did it. And that's the, you know, that, that, that's probably the harder part. Yeah. So that, that was oh, a good and, By uh, the way, Jeff, I have suggested that Tableau, the, the, the prize money, should be retroactive to 2014. So <laughs> thank you, thank you. Steve. Still about 50 <laughs> years after you entered it, right, Steve? <laughs> uh, 46. I, thank yeah, you. I just seriously would encourage people to get involved. Um, you, you know, the people who w- a you might want to win, right? You might, you might, if you're firing for that prize money. It's not the people who know Tableau best who win and get on that stage. It's people who understand how to tell a great story, and that doesn't require super 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 advanced tableau skills so don't let that be a barrier don't let it be a barrier anyway if you just want to get involved because putting your toes into the water of the tableau community is a surefire way of developing your skills your sense of camaraderie and your and your growth within the field um so get have a go well, with that, I think that's a good note to, uh, on that note of encouragement, Andy, that you don't have to be a Tableau Zen master currently to be an Iron Viz competitor. Um, I think that's a good note to go ahead and close out our session today uh, just with a couple uh, pieces of housekeeping and giving you that link if you want to join us on the uh, follow-up after party. Uh, there are some new Big Book of Dashboards um, trainings coming up, and you can always look at the Big Book of Dashboards as a resource. Now, someone asked if there was a copyright infringement issue on our Q&A. Uh, might be worth a check on the link. 
Uh, the second is uh, just flagging here the dates for those upcoming. Uh, there's a wait, dashboard. there's a counterfeit copy of the big book of dashboards. We picked the big time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve, anything you want to share about the upcoming big book of dashboards workshops happening online in September? Yeah, just just um, there. You know, just open this up. Uh, first 10 people get a discount for registering. So let people know about it. And um, uh, they've all been selling out. So don't wait too long. I'll give the ringing endorsement that my, my director, who's been working in this space for 20 years, went to your workshop and said it was the best workshop she's attended on dashboards and data visualization. So uh, it's a great way to go ahead and build your skills. Put that little extra part in. You couldn't just say the best dashboard workshop she attended. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> and then last up, if you want to join us to chat about anything from today's session or to go ahead and talk about uh, any other burning data viz questions or other things going on, feel free to join us on the after party. Go ahead and grab a screenshot of this bit.ly link because it will go away when we close this uh, Zoom webinar. We'll go ahead and open up in a Zoom meeting so you all have the ability to turn your cameras on, chat, talk. Um, you're not beholden just to the chat box. So we hope to see some of you joining us to continue the conversation there. And shout yeah. out to the man behind the scenes, Clevin Flairledge, who is uh, battling uh, COVID-19 at the moment, uh, but still producing ridiculously uh, great blog posts and work as this stuff is going on and is a uh, uh, he's our bouncer, which we didn't need <laughs> need this time around. We have not been Zoom bombed in a while, and I think they know better than the mess with Kevin. So thank you. And if you're not watching his Twitter feed and his adventures and strange food combinations, thanks to the uh, loss of taste and smell from COVID-19, um, I think those are some of my daily highlights are seeing some of the entertaining ways that he's combining new things and then learning that people yeah. actually like those combinations, like peanut butter on hamburgers. Yeah, it's strange. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and close out this session here today. Thank you again for joining us today for Chart Chat. We hope that you'll join us again in September when we come back from our summer hiatus. Um, as always, we appreciate your time and look forward to continuing the conversation here on the after party. See you soon. And there will be a recording of this at some point. Thank you so much. Thank you.